Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm John Allen. I'm the president of the Brookings Institution. It's a great honor to welcome you all to today's conference on American leadership and advancing sustainable development goals or the SDGs. This is the third iteration of our partnership with the United Nations Foundation. And so we're very glad that you were able to take the time today to join us this afternoon. Now, since the first iteration uh, of this evolution in, in 2019, this meeting has become a rendezvous spot uh, for the various community and local leaders uh, who are at the vanguard of advancing sustainable development in the United States. At Brookings, we're extremely proud that our new Center for Sustainable Development can help to contribute to this important effort. Now, with the 76th the United Nations General Assembly happening this week, it's most appropriate that we gather today to talk about the SDGs and their role as, quote, a blueprint to achieve a better, more sustainable future for all, unquote. The focus of the SDGs on leaving no one or no community behind is more essential in 2021 than ever. Climate change continues to be one of the most pressing crises of our time. And this past summer, we reached some of the highest temperatures ever recorded. In the US, wildfires continue to threaten large swaths of the West Coast. And where we used to talk about a fire season, people are beginning to talk about a fire year. Meanwhile, communities from Louisiana to Philadelphia are beginning to recover from the devastation of Hurricane Ida and more destructive weather is on the way. Besides climate change, we also continue to battle an, an ongoing global health crisis taking not only the lives and the livelihoods of over 675,000 Americans, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed massive inequality and also caused widespread unemployment and food and water insecurity and made any form of financial relief far more difficult. Last but not least, local leaders across the United States are on the front lines in addressing systemic racism and inequity. Now, recognizing the complexity of these eventually existential issues, many U.S. cities and states and universities and philanthropies and corporations have started to look into the UN's SDGs for their respective blueprints for their ways ahead. Utilized as a policy framework for local laws and initiatives, the SDGs were created so that they could address multiple pressing and frequently interrelated issues at once, as well as to mobilize for progress on ambitious targets, such as inclusion, justice, equity, and of course, sustainability. In many respects, the incorporation of the SDGs into local and state policies highlights just how much the SDGs are rooted in our shared and cherished values, our American values, and how its themes must be echoed across our different levels of government and in our role in the world. Now tomorrow, Joe Biden uh, will take the stage at the UN for the first time as the President of the United States. And since taking office, the Biden administration has taken concerted efforts to emphasize the return of US norms and has worked hard to do that, often displaying or deploying the mantra, America is back. Uh, through this administration's so-called Build Back Better agenda, and the upcoming Summit for Democracy, President Biden and his cabinet have sought to, to demonstrate a commitment to advancing an equitable and sustainable recovery for all. Still, there is plenty of work to be done. We have only nine years left until the proposed deadline of the SDGs in 2030. This is why it's opportunities like these, where we can convene local and community and state leaders who have the foresight and the courage to think of new ways that the US can ensure that the world remains equitable and sustainable as a place for all. Our country's credibility depends on the extent to which we show the world just how well we can take care of these issues right here at home. And it's through brave and forward thinking individuals such as yourselves that we can really show just how much America takes the SDGs to heart. So to that end, and once again, I wanna thank the United Nations Foundation for providing its generous support to the Brookings Center for Sustainable Development, which helps us to make our work possible and our contributions a reality. And with that, I'm, I'm most pleased, very pleased 
to introduce Cynthia Yu, who was recently selected as the 10th United Nations Association of the United States Youth Observer to the United Nations. A Tennessee native and a senior at George Washington University in Washington, DC, we had, she had made it her personal mission to connect young Americans to the important work of the United Nations. She's truly an example of the next generation who's gonna carry on this great work, those voices that are actively shaping our future for the future. So Cynthia, it's wonderful to have you with us. Congratulations on your selected selection and we turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much, President Allen, and thank you to the United Nations Foundation and the Brookings Institute for hosting this incredible event. I'm so honored to join everyone today to discuss how young people are leading the charge for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Being here today means so much to me on a personal level. From my earliest days, I was exposed to the inequities that exist across our globe. My grandfather was the oldest of six children in a country torn by war, poverty, and hunger. By the time he turned 13, he'd watched as all of his younger siblings passed away. Just two generations later, my older sister passed away at a young age from preventable causes. And that is why I dream of a world where we carry out the SDGs. I dream of a world where no child is ever ripped from the threads of life. I dream of a world where we build bridges instead of walls. I dream of a world where we unite together to make tomorrow better than today. And thankfully, in my first month as the U.S. Youth Observer, through meeting some of our nation's greatest youth activists, I've seen a world in which young people share and uplift that dream. Recently, I engaged in a listening tour where I personally met with and gathered data from hundreds of young people across the nation. And this is what I found. Our generation is alarmed. I've listened to stories of students who are experiencing the real life consequences of climate change. A college sophomore whose home was three feet underwater as a result of a flood far worse than expected. A girl who joined the conversation from a car while fleeing a hurricane. A high school student who looked through the window and witnessed a wildfire one day and a snowstorm the next. Our generation is living with the impacts of some of our world's most pressing issues, and we're concerned. But we're not just crying for help, we're taking action. The SDGs paint a dream of a better world, and young people are making it a reality. Through my listening tour, I've listened to students in Iowa who successfully rallied their government officials to adopt new forms of clean energy in a, after a once in a thousand years flood. I listened to young Americans who were fighting to introduce anti-racism and the SDGs into their school curriculum. I've listened to students from all over the nation united in solidarity for racial, socioeconomic, and gender equality. And that is why young people need to be heard, heard by our leaders, heard by our communities, heard by everyone. Though we comprise a third of the population, many of our nation's youth have told me that oftentimes, even when they have a chance to speak, nobody takes them seriously. As a woman of color who grew up in rural America, I know what that feels like. My agenda as the youth observer this year is to lift up youth voices, especially those from underrepresented communities. All facets, all facets of youth must be represented equally and receive critical resources for civic activism, regardless of who they are or where they come from. Generation Z grew up in the age of the internet, the age of exponential globalization, the age of activism. According to a recent poll from the United Nations Foundation, a plurality of Gen Z adults and millennials believe their generations are more equipped than older generations to solve our world's most pressing issues. And a majority of Gen Z -er adults and millennials say they believe younger generations can have a positive impact on each of the global priorities. We mobilize both in the instance of change and for the change of instances. My vision for the SDGs is for our nation's leaders to prioritize the implementation of policies that keep the UN's dream alive. 
In my term as the UNA USA Youth Observer, I will partner with our Global Goals Ambassadors, empower local SDG service projects through our 200 chapters nationwide, and support our partnerships to turn data into delivery. Our world can only drive forward the SDGs if we ensure that every person is included in the ride, especially our nation's youth. We have our voices, now we just need to be heard. Hear us as we march for progress as UNA USA advocates. Hear us as we publicize our voices in the 2021 Youth Observer listening to our report this week. Hear us as we pour our hearts and minds into the SDG dream. Think of all that our world could accomplish if it amplified a third of its population. I once dreamed of a world where we would unite together to make tomorrow better than today. In my first month as the U.S. Youth Observer, I've seen how youth leaders have answered that call. Thank you. I'm now pleased to introduce the youngest big city mayor in the U.S., the Honorable May Kate, Mayor Kate Gallego from the city of Phoenix. Thank you, Cynthia. On behalf of the people of Phoenix, I am so pleased to be with you here today to celebrate American leadership on sustainable development goals. I'm optimistic that we are going to come together as a country and that cities will join with our companies, universities, nonprofits, and others to really establish that our country cares deeply about sustainable development and that we'll be, we will be leaders on SDGs. Thank you to all of you who have committed so much to make today's event possible, but also the progress we're making as a nation and as a planet. I'm looking forward to global convenings, including one around climate change in Glasgow coming up in just a few short months, and believe that today's events will help give us momentum. Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the United States and the fastest growing. We are politically and economically diverse. We welcome refugees. We're a community led by women at the moment, we also really have some important challenges still to address, including basic issues such as hunger. That's why it's important for us to be here today and to be part of this conversation. The city of Phoenix is in the midst of an initiative called Phoenix Global Rising that I was proud to announce a little over a year ago. It has several areas of focus, one of which is achieving our sustainable development goals and that Phoenix can be a key portion of those goals. We're working with the Sun Thunderbird School of Global Management, part of Arizona State University, on a voluntary local review. This will be very important to us and help make sure we are metric driven as we work to provide economic opportunity, to make sure we have great education, and to address challenges that are so important to our city, such as climate change. It's important, I think, to note that Phoenix is doing that. We are in the largest voting jurisdiction to switch between political parties. We are very diverse in terms of our backgrounds and our industries. We're home to Fortune 500 companies that range from PetSmart to a global mining giant. And we are a microcosm of both America and of our globe. We think that we can provide part of the momentum and the great political support to show that SDGs are important and that there is strong political will to achieve them. So I wanna thank you to all those who are partners in, in doing it. Um, it's personally important to me. By background, I um, have uh, worked in sustainability and hold an environmental degree. I have a lot of family working globally, whether it be the US State Department or partner organizations. And I hope that I can be part of bringing together leaders locally to support what is happening globally. I work particularly a lot on climate change and I'm excited to be working for cities race to zero uh, to move towards net zero by 2050. We think we will have a thousand cities that are part of that by the time we convene in Glasgow. I'm also excited to express my commitment and support to achieving the sustainable development goals. It's incredibly ambitious, but now is the right time and I feel like we have the partnerships. I look forward to working with you to ensure that no one is left behind as we achieve our sustainable development goals. Thank you, Mayor Gallegos, for your remarks and your leadership in 
Phoenix and with the Sustainable Development Goals. It's so great to hear from you and your innovations. Um, it's uh, something that we can all learn from. It's so great also to have the opportunity to hear from Cynthia. Let's listen to our young people. They are leading. Uh, they get that this matters. And uh, with their help, we will find our way out of this. Um, the Brookings Institution and the UN Foundation for co-hosting this important event. I am so thrilled to be here today. Um, in my old life, I lived and breathed the Sustainable Development Goals every single day as we were negotiating them to make them a reality. Now we're six years into the goals. There's only nine years left. So they're more important than ever and it's time to take stock. My name is Ana Maria Rilagos and I'm president of the Hispanics in Philanthropy. We are a network of funders, of donors, of individuals working across the Americas to build, to fund, and to fuel Latinx power, economic opportunity, justice and equity. We'll soon be celebrating our 40th uh, birthday and we invite you to, to work with us as we do this work across the Americas. Today, I'm calling from New Mexico. So I'm excited to um, be on a panel on a day that's highlighting the Southwest uh, with Phoenix and San Diego. And of course, the important work that's happening with um, our young leaders and also in Orlando. And I'm excited to be moderating a discussion with our esteemed panels. Uh, the special focus of our session will be how the SDGs advance equity. And um, after the past year and a half, which has exposed and exacerbated the inequalities and the vulnerabilities in the US that we all knew were here. It's just wonderful to be here with like-minded people that want to understand, want to um, really push forward. As John Allen noted earlier, we are facing a moment of awakening the effects of systemic racism, of poverty, of inequality, of climate change um, have been beyond anything that we can have imagined. And so this opportunity to reshape our efforts and to ensure that no one left behind is really important. And we can do that through the sustainable development goals as we've heard from the other speakers today. They are, and the reason why I'm so excited and why this matters, it's an opportunity to address our greatest common challenges, offers common language, connects us again across sectors, disciplines, geographies, offers us metrics. Um, it's just it, a, a, such powerful work. And to share with us how they are thinking about it and their strategies. We have a wonderful panel here today to get us started. I'll briefly introduce them and um, then we'll go from there. Uh, first, it's my extreme pleasure to welcome Dr. Helene Gale. She is the CEO and president of the Chicago Community Trust. Uh, before that, she led the International Humanitarian Organization CARE for over a decade. We all know CARE's work and we all know the work of the Chicago Community Trust. Fantastic work. She's very familiar with the Sustainable Development Goals and she has um, been using them both internationally and locally in Chicago for a long, long time. So lots of lessons there. Uh, we have Carmen Villar, who is the Vice President of Social Business Innovation at Merck, and she's been working specifically in the US, so Carmen will ask you to talk about that work. And finally, my old friend, uh, Dr. Michael McAfee, who is the CEO and President of PolicyLink. Uh, PolicyLink is a good ally with Hispanics in philanthropy. Their central mission is to advance racial and economic equity. They do this by pushing for policies that ensure all people, especially people of color, have economic security, live in healthy communities of opportunity and benefit from a just society, things that we all, all want. So Michael, let's stay with you and a um, couple questions and then we'll go on to the rest of our panel. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there are 17 SDGs and they vary from gender to peace and security to urbanization. But at the core of the sustainable development goals of the framework, it's about language and metrics so that, as was said earlier, we're leaving no one behind. In your opinion, why is this comprehensive approach to advancing equity so crucial? And what does it look like in practice? Great to be here. Um, 
to see you again, Anna Marie, and to be on this esteemed panel. Um, I want you to hold a number, 100 million plus, one in three people in America, wealthiest nation in the world who are economically insecure. And when you think about why one in three, 100 million plus are economically insecure, it's for the very reason all of those SG, the SDGs have been established. And so the reality is we're talking about a scale that programs, charitable acts will not solve. Those things are important, but this is a design challenge for the nation. It's actually the design challenge of the nation that has caused us to be in this situation in the first place. And so I really want us to begin to hold that this is just not some random phenomena that you have 100 million folks, 48% of whom are white, that are struggling to make ends meet in this nation. Our democracy and our economy has not fundamentally been optimized for this group. And that's the opportunity that is embodied in the SDGs. So the first thing I would say is, if you can begin to do research that will disaggregate these populations, you can begin to see the SDGs are the path forward to their liberation. And what I'm signaling to you first and foremost is the research for that 100 million came from a partnership with MasterCard and PolicyLink. And so one of the first things we need to do when we think about the SGDs is hold the interest of entire populations because we have to be operating at the scale that is commensurate with the problem. That's the first thing. And what does it look like practically? Well, when you think about economic insecurity or poverty, all you have to do is look at the recent issues around the pandemic. You know, when we did research around rent burden, who's behind on rent in America, more than 5.8 million folks are behind on rent in this nation. Think about housing stability and getting evicted in all the ways in which it cuts across those SDGs. So the first thing you hear me signaling is that if leaders can hold the consciousness of achieving results at scale, we've got a fighting chance to make significant progress on the SDGs. The second is for us to think about the design of place, local, county, state, and federal. There is a design to our democracy and our economy, and we have to get honest about it. And if we can see those systems, then we can change them. And practically, you're beginning to see State legislatures, city councils do this, most recently in California, um, passing new legislation that allows us to build more density in places mm -hmm. that often were only zoned for single family housing. This is a huge leap forward for affordable housing in California. It doesn't fully solve the problem, but to be able to build up to 10 units in places that were typically just zoned for single family housing, that is one example. Another example is seeing what this administration, the Biden administration, did with um, lifting children and families out of poverty with the American Rescue Plan. These are examples of holding the interest of entire populations and beginning to make progress on improving their lives. Now, the real question is, can we sustain this? And that is ultimately the reality of what we're charged with. Boutique initiatives won't do this. Acts of charity won't do this. Asking philanthropy to bear the weight of financing this won't sustain this. Government at every level is our scaling apparatus. And our job is to get our governing institutions to think about serving this population maximally. So I'll stop there. But this 100 million is our path to success with the SDGs. Thank you, Michael. Um, that's fascinating. So boutique initiatives won't solve this. The only way to scale is by getting the government, getting us all together. And that way we hold the interest of the entire population. And so that's a great segue into uh, Dr. Gale. Let's zero in on equity and what that looks like in the Chicago region. What are the specific challenges and opportunities that you're working with in Chicago related to the SDG framework? And how do you connect to what Michael said in terms of scale? Yeah, thanks so much, Anna Marie. And first of all, let me say how wonderful it is to be with my panelists. Um, 
both of whom I admire and uh, have had the opportunity to work with over years. I could start telling stories about Carmen when we worked together at CDC and how she taught me everything I know about the internet. But anyway, um, <laughs> a, a story for another day. Anyway, you know, one of the things, having had a career that has fluctuated between the global and the domestic, um, I am so thrilled that we're having this conversation about how we think about the SDGs in the United States, because for too long, we have helped to forward frameworks that we have not used ourselves. And we've kind of used UN frameworks as things that are for everybody but the United States. And I think the fact that we're now starting to use the SDG framework uh, and I, you know, I also want to give uh, real uh, props to Tony Pippa and the team at, at Brookings for really helping us to think about how do we take this global framework and make it relevant to the United States and remind us that the same inequities that we see between con countries um, also apply to the inequities that we see here in the United States between populations. And I think Michael did such a good job of, of framing that. And so, you know, in Chicago, um, and particularly with our, with our community foundation, the Chicago Community Trust, we launched um, a strategy a couple of years ago focused on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap. And we did that because, you know, Chicago, like so many urban um, environments, have a lot of issues, you know, uh, life expectancy gap, education gap, the issues of violence and public safety, et cetera. But underneath all of those are these uh, inequities that are linked to economic opportunities that have been structurally um, designed such that some populations have better outcomes than others. And much of that is linked to our racial uh, past. And so, you know, past and I, I, not our racial past, it's, it's linked to many of the things that we continue to deal with today. So we said closing this economic um, gap in this uh, economic inequity that is linked to uh, racial segregation and, and history would be an important underlying issue for all the other things we hope to achieve in that. And as a result of kind of taking that as our approach, we've looked to frameworks like the SDGs as ways in which we can not only look at this, you know, Michael said, disaggregating the information here for us in Chicago, but how do we link what we're doing to, you know, the global focus on equity and inequity? And I firmly believe that if we at a local level here in Chicago can link our work to what's going on globally, it will give all of us uh, a greater grounding, um, a framework that we can look at ourselves across, not just cities and localities here in the United States, but help us to understand what are these issues that transcend local um, geographies and are really part of you know, what we want to, to do to create a better world overall. Um, you know, we're working with institutions like our, the University of Chicago, the policy school, which is helping us to look at how we take the SDGs and, and make those relevant to our local context. The Mott Foundation that has really put a lot of resources into thinking about how the SDGs are used at the local level. So I just think this is an incredibly powerful framework, um, both in a very practical way, but also in a conceptual way for us to start thinking of ourselves as not part, you know, not walled off from the rest of the world, but recognizing that many of the systemic barriers that we face here in the United States are not dissimilar from the same sort of systemic barriers. And if we start thinking about it as systems change here in the United States, but linked to some of the systems change that we're pushing at the global level, I think we will all benefit. So 
you know, I believe this local to global continuum is so important. And for us as the United States to start recognizing we are part of the globe and our issues have a lot in common with some of the issues that we face around the world, I think we will be better off. And I think we'll be able to really make some of the changes that we want to see. So. Thank, thank you so much, Helene. I really appreciate that. And I think I'm the only one that doesn't know Carmen. So I'm really excited to meet you, Carmen, even with on Zoom. Um, we've heard from policymakers. We've learned from philanthropy. Let's talk about how do you see it from the landscape where you sit in corporate space at Merck? Um, what are the particular challenges of addressing health inequities here in the US? We've seen um, that it affects not just health access and quality, but really the disparities affect everything from education to economy, housing, everything, well-being. So from your perspective, what are the biggest challenges in advancing health equity? Sure. Thanks, Ana Maria, and it's a pleasure to meet you as well, and to all of my panelists and our hosts, uh, the UN Foundation and Brookings. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about this very important issue, which has always been an important issue. I just want to remind us that people like myself and Helene and, and, and many others on this call have been working uh, in, in the public sector on issues related to social determinants of health and health equity for a very long time. And, and what's amazing to me is, is what's happened in terms of that work over the last few years when we've seen inequities play out in real time, when the entire world has been impacted by COVID. And we know now that access to vaccines or access to care related to COVID has been unevenly distrib distributed. And, and I think that's really something we have to look at to Helene's point when she talks about we are a globally connected world right? We are dealing with some of the challenges we're dealing with now because of that very issue, because we travel everywhere, because we ship things, we import and we export things, because it takes a global world to, to promote a global economy. And as a business, we would be remiss if we were not very concerned about these issues and coming to the table to have these important discussions. Um, at Merck, you know, we have partnered um, in terms of our efforts during the pandemic, really, since we, we don't have uh, one of the vaccines on the market, which I know we're, um, we're all a little disappointed by, but we have partnered with the government, the U.S. government and BARDA in, in a manufacturing agreement to really try to ramp up capacity around manufacturing vaccines. We're also working with J&J &J on this effort to make vaccines available. But I have to say that 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 is not enough. We know that making products available, we need to take it one step further. We need to ensure that, that people actually have individual patient access. And I think we have learned a lot from our global efforts. When we think about, we have a, a big initiative around maternal mortality called Merck for Mothers. And we've done a lot of work globally in that program. And one thing you realize when you live and you work overseas is that Everybody has one of these, right? Everybody has a cell phone. They may have never had a landline in their home. They may not have access to much other technology, but they have one of these. And so in working through Merck for Mothers in a platform called Nivi, we developed um, an interactive chat platform where anybody anonymously could submit questions around family planning or maternal health and get answers. And, and we found that we had a lot of diversity in terms of who was accessing. Um, we had males, we had adolescents and children, we had obviously pregnant moms because that was the target audience, but lots of questions um, that were coming in uh, and we first started in Kenya and now we're moving to other countries. But through that platform, we realized that we could also answer critical questions about COVID. And so we made that information available and we also did it the other way around. So if, if users were coming in asking about COVID specific issues, we answered those questions. And then we also designed content specific to family planning, which was our original target um, with the digital platform. And I think that that has really helped us understand how much more we can do in the U.S. And through our, our U.S. efforts in our Merck for Mothers program, through an initiative called the Safer Childbirth Cities Initiative, 
Right now, what's happening is a lot of mothers, pregnant women are afraid to seek the routine kind of care that they need. And so we have supported virtual, virtual home visits with doulas who get on the phones and uh, track women postpartum to make sure that they're healthy, to answer their questions, to provide referrals, including related to COVID-19 in, uh, information, whether it be vaccines, uh, treatment, or other issues that they may be dealing with at home and feeling like they can't safely return to care. And I think that is one of our biggest challenges. We know that routine immunizations are down. I know personally that people, uh, my mother did not receive her annual mammogram. It skipped a year because of COVID. Um, and when she went in the next time, she had, there was some growth and there's some issues now that she has to deal with. So this idea of our regular well-being, what we, what that looked like before COVID and how we expect it to be going forward is critical. And there's a lot of questions there that we still have yet to answer. Um, digital solutions can really help. Um, but I think that my biggest point that I make to my folks and internally at Merck is really to think about the old adage of you have to start where the patient is or where the client is, right? We have to understand what people don't understand and help them get that education of the basics, whatever it might be, so that they are uh, trusting the system, they are seeking care. You know, I've heard anecdotes of people saying things like, I don't need a COVID vaccine. I just had a COVID test and I was negative. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we have to get the right community leaders, the right voices out there, um, delivering the right messages so that people understand why it is important, why prevention is important, why vaccines are important, um, why taking care of some of their baseline healthcare needs is important. So we have been trying to address all of these issues, obviously not by ourselves, in the spirit of SDG 17 and in partnership with many others um, on, this, on this call today, uh, but also all over the world. And we still have more to do as a community, a healthcare community. Thank you, Carmen. We have less than 10 minutes to go. So I'm gonna ask you another question and let's keep it short, like sure. one or two minutes. But what I really wanna hear in addition to what you just covered, which is how Merck is addressing the communities. I'd love to hear how Merck is developing the corporate strategy. How do you make sure that it's deeply embedded within the organization and entire, and it permeates the entire culture of the organization? Because that's what we're working towards, corporate America picking mm -hmm. this up. So how is that happening? Yeah, I, yeah. I'm going to ask you to answer in a minute and a half. Okay, but. I'll go quick. I'll just say that at Merck, we have a long history of uh, really committing to social impact and business mm -hmm. impact together. I think um, folks may know about our Mectazan donation program where we've committed, um, you know, uh, Mectazan to the world uh, free of charge to try to eliminate river blindness. Um, and, and we're trying to do that um, domestically, too. I think the mindset of businesses has changed over the last five years. We know that from what CEO Roundtable and others have said, what Larry Fink asks us to do every year, et cetera. And, and one thing I think is that we have to hold ourselves accountable. We were talking about measures earlier and how we really have to know what the data say and, and what we look like going forward. That informs how we measure ourselves and how in a business we reward ourselves. So one of the things that we're doing, and I know a lot of companies have, are doing this or have done this, is holding ourselves accountable. How do we weave? ESG metrics, so environmental, social, and governance metrics throughout the company. So right now, we are making a proposal to actually include a ESG metrics within our performance scorecard, which it, within our annual scorecard every year, so that it becomes a material issue, something that we hold ourselves accountable to every day at Merck. Because as individuals, we do. And as a company, we need to make that statement and come together collectively. That's helpful. So really embedded in, in the performance and doing those scorecards. Um, Helene, um, I heard about your moonshot, but at the same time, parallel to that, I also saw the Urban Institute's new report. Uh, Chicago's majority white neighborhoods receive 4.6 times the private market investment than majority black neighborhoods. 
2.6 times more than majority Latinx neighborhoods. This worries me. How do you use that? How do you concretize it and humanize it on the ground and actually make it fit with the sustainable development goals? Can't hear you. So yeah, so maybe just picking up from where, where Carmen left off, you know, I we talk a lot about the role that government plays, but um, you know, I think it's more important than ever the role that the private sector plays. And, you know, when I entered into my career uh, more decades ago than I like to think about, you know, you were, if, if you wanted to do things that were towards social good, you either went into government or the, the nonprofit sector. And, you know, the for profit sector, corporations, uh, private sector was considered the dark side. And I think those lines are being blurred more than ever. And I think for, uh, you know, a lot of the reasons that, that Carmen talked about, you know, the private sector um, and, you know, corporate sector are now thinking about what is their mission and what is their purpose. We have two sources of renewable capital in this world. We have taxpayer dollars that go into the public sector and we have the private sector that makes money, and that's what they do. Both are renewable sources of capital that are more and more tied to how do we make the world a better place? Because it's in everybody's interest. More and more, you know, companies are realizing it is in their interest. Um, it is in their financial interest to be good corporate citizens, to invest in their communities, to make sure that we have a sustainable planet um, that will continue to produce, that there is not the kind of instability that comes with inequity. Um, and, you know, this is more and more being uh, kind of incorporated into how the private sector sees its work. And so, you know, for us on the ground, we have said we will take a very, besides what we do as philanthropy, I think philanthropy does great work. You know, I have been in philanthropy multiple times in different iterations, I think it does great work. But as Michael said, philanthropy cannot solve this alone. We can be catalysts. We can help to uh, shine the light on these issues. We can help to pilot initiatives. And to your point about investment, we can help de-risk some of the investments that private sector may not do by itself. But ultimately, we need all of these partners. We need government, we need the private sector, we need philanthropy to be able to create the kinds of solutions. So I see we only have a few minutes left, so I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but as an example, we have an initiative where we're working with companies in Chicago to make good on a lot of the promises that they made after the murder of George Floyd. We're calling it the 525 initiative uh, initiative to action, you know, because there are a lot of people who made pledges and we said, let's go back a year later and ask people, how do you turn those pledges into action, concrete action such that you can actually make difference on the ground? So, you know, bottom line, you know, I think we will all do better when we, we think about not one sector versus the other, but how do we all come together, bring our complementary resources, then I think we can make good on the SDGs on the ground by all playing the roles that we can play. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helene. Um, Michael, um, a one and a half minute quick conversation on the trade-offs. I mean, this all impacts trade-offs. How do we do both recovery efforts and how do we deliberately address the needs of low income communities of communities of color? One and a half minutes and then we'll wrap up. Can't hear you. This is the work of our generation, quite frankly, and Carmen and Dr. Gale really signal it. You know, corporate America, I think, is at the leading edge of the equity movement because they have a unique skill. They know how to bend the legal and regulatory framework of the nation to their will. And we need them to continue to step into this moment and bend the legal and regulatory framework of this nation toward the will of folks who have been left behind. Now, ultimately, the reality is this. Um, we've got to become, begin to in, um, implement accountability measures into this work. You know, the reality is if locales aren't delivering on outcomes for this population, we should seriously consider, do they continue to deserve resources? 
And I know that this is often a third rail, but the reality is this, we can't continue to pump dollars into communities that are actually working against the return of investment that we're trying to achieve. So I think in one way, corporate America stepping into this way, into this work like they are, is a leading edge moment for the equity movement. I think that's going to deliver some serious results. I think the other is us actually centering this population and refusing to advance strategies that don't center them first. If we do not implement accountability measures, this will be another time, we'll come back in five years, it will have been a lot of rhetoric, a lot of paper will have been produced, but we won't see the outcomes. Ultimately, all of us should be pushing ourselves to answer one fundamental question. Is that 100 million quantitatively better off? The SDGs are measurable. They are measurable. And just as corporate leaders bring great accountability to their enterprises, the work of achieving the SDGs deserves the same level of treatment from all of us, from all three sectors, government, civil society, and business. Great, thank you so much. We talked about scaling, accountability, the corporate sector, who does this, um, why this all matters and what we would like to see in the future. I really appreciate it. We could have had another hour for sure, but this is a wrap and um, we'll hear from the following uh, panelists. And I really, really appreciate you all for joining us today. With that, it is time to introduce the Honorable Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs, member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you so much. Bye. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here with you all. Thank you, Emory, for the introduction, and thank you to everyone at Brookings uh, and the UN Foundation for putting together this event. I'm so grateful to be with you all today because your work in building sustainable, resilient, and inclusive communities is vitally important. This UN General Assembly comes at a really unique moment where we as a global community are looking at how to rebuild after COVID. And it's actually pretty amazing that we had the foresight to create the UN Sustainable Development Goals that can give us a pretty much an exact blueprint for how we need to rebuild. We know it's important for each country to commit to this work, and we know it's important to do this as a global community. In Congress, we're talking a lot right now about building back better. You may have heard about it, how the status quo before COVID wasn't working for too many families and how we need to chart a path forward with equity at the core. And that's what the Sustainable Development Goals are all about. This moment has also taught us another important lesson. It's taught us that it can't just be big institutions doing the work. We have to focus locally on the needs of each of our communities and what local stakeholders can bring to the table. We have to build the world we want community by community, neighborhood by neighborhood, because we've learned that what happens in one neighborhood can affect all of us. That's why it's so important that we're focusing this work, not just from the top down, but from the bottom up with our communities leading the way. In San Diego, our local association of governments is beginning the process of localizing SDG goals for the San Diego region. Our county government in partnership with local universities is developing a regional decarbonization framework to provide a science-based vision for reaching net zero emissions regionally. And prior to coming to Congress, I founded a nonprofit organization called San Diego for Every Child that's working on ending childhood poverty in San Diego and piloting a guaranteed income initiative. What's essential about all of these efforts is that they're data-driven. Highlighting these local efforts, as I know you all have been doing all day, also speaks to an important difference between the sustainable development goals in the 2030 agenda and many previous development programs. This is an expansive and inclusive program, and the United States is not existing above or apart from these goals. The United States is part of these goals because to be a global leader, the United States has to be a global example. And it's clear, whether it's ending poverty and hunger, ensuring access to quality education, addressing climate change, or building peaceful, just, and strong institutions, we here in the United States have a lot of work left to do. But I and so many of my colleagues here in Congress 
know that we have to meet this moment. Right now, this week, we're working on the Build Back Better Act, a massive investment in our families and in our communities. We're focusing on climate resilience, universal pre-K, child care for families who need it, and so much more. It's an enormous challenge, but it's an even greater opportunity to work together in the midst of this domestic and global crisis to reimagine the world we want to create and make the investments to get it done. Because at the end of this day, these issues aren't abstract issues. They're not big uh, things that don't impact people. This is about what families across the world are living every day. Every time I'm back home in my district, I have the chance to talk directly to constituents about the challenges they're facing and what they need from the government. After Congress passed the expanded and improved child tax credit, I had the chance to talk with the parents who are benefiting about what those investments will mean for their families. They talked to me with tears in their eyes, not only about being able to afford groceries and rent and school supplies, but about the fact that for the very first time, they were able to think about their kids' future. That is the gift that we're giving families across the country with these sustainable development goals. With just one bill, with just one program, we were able to cut childhood poverty here again in this country in half. And we're gonna continue that work with the Build Back Better Act. But we know it's not just about what we're doing here in the United States, it's also about what the United States is doing around the world. We have to center human rights and building communities. We have to center partnering with other countries, not telling them what to do or scolding them. We need to be the global example that we claim to be. So thank you all again so much for having me here today. I am so honored and proud to be doing this work alongside all of you and so thankful for the work all of you are doing to make sure that these goals that we're all so committed to are actually getting implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Jacobs, for those inspiring words. Congressional leadership is so vital for achieving the SDGs, and we thank you for that. Looks like we may have a brief technical glitch, so I will hold for a moment. Great, I understand it actually is working, terrific. Um, hello again to everybody. And thank you uh, at the beginning to all of our wonderful colleagues at the Brookings Institution, with whom we've been so proud to roll up our sleeves over these last few years to connect local leaders and partners and bring their incredible stories to you. And thanks to everyone who is joining today. My name is Elizabeth Cousins and I'm the president and CEO of the United Nations Foundation. I was also the US negotiator on the SDGs, and I can tell you that it was precisely their relevance to us right here at home, as our last panel just so beautifully demonstrated, and as the Congresswoman did, that pushed the US to negotiate such an ambitious and universal agenda. And today, our commitment to the goals, our shared roadmap to equity, justice, and environmental resilience is even more urgent. Our country and our world face a confluence of crises. We're 18 months into a pandemic that has exacerbated disparities across issues, particularly for people of color. Inequality is on the rise and systemic racism persists. And the growing destruction and frequency of extreme weather is a devastating reminder of the rising costs if we fail to address climate change. But the SDGs give us a different path. They provide a common language and strategies to address these issues and more, and to ensure a more inclusive and sustainable recovery. Just consider a few examples of local leaders who are putting the SDGs into action. New York City. At our inaugural event here in 2019, New York City announced the Voluntary Local Review Declaration, a process for local governments anywhere to report on SDG progress that sparked a global movement with hundreds of local and regional governments now involved. Los Angeles just this morning launched their second voluntary local review. Mayor Garcetti spoke about that at our event last year. Hawaii also last year released the first ever statewide voluntary local review using data from Hawaii's own Aloha Plus Challenge, a model that's now being shared with the islands around the world. Carnegie Mellon University launched the first ever university-wide review of the SDGs last year. There is so much positive work being done in the United States and there is so much more we can do. 
That's why I'm truly excited to welcome now Mayor Buddy Dyer from the city of Orlando, a true leader on the SDGs, to talk about his experience in the Sunshine State. Welcome, Mayor Dyer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. It is great to see you. Well, let's dig uh, right in. Um, Mayor Dyer, you launched GreenWorks Orlando, a sustainability initiative to enhance quality of life and spur economic growth in your city in 2007, almost 15 years ago. What led you to take that initiative back then and how does that work relate to your approach to the SDGs? So let me begin by thanking you and your entire UNF and Brookings Institute teams for hosting us and inviting us to be part of it. You'll meet a number of people from the city of Orlando on the panel after we're finished here and uh, they'll tell you about some of the great work we're doing. But I became mayor back in 2003 and Orlando was pretty much already a globally recognized city, but primarily for our world-class entertainment and our theme parks. I would be anywhere in the world and say Orlando and people would say uh, Orlando, Disney, Universal. So Orlando is much more than just its theme parks. And we think we're poised to be one of the great cities in the 21st century. So in 2007, one of the ways that we, we thought if you're gonna be a great city, you have to be a sustainable city. So we launched our GreenWorks program and, and I've been impressed with what they were doing in Chicago, quite honestly, when I decided to launch that. And we wanted to be a future ready city and that means being environmentally friendly, socially equitable and inclusive. And that's why we eventually got to the SDGs down the line. But we did a lot of work in the community to understand what their vision, our vision as a community was, uh, what our needs were, what we should be focusing on. And for our GreenWorks program, we came up with seven key priority areas and they were urban, including urban, urban sustainability, clean energy, local food systems, zero waste, alternative transportation, and clean water. And that was our strategy. And as we learned more about the SDGs, we have almost 80 million people visit our city in non-pandemic years. And we thought it was important to align our local priorities with a global framework. And to our, to our great surprise, it actually helped us build within our team and our framework within our community additional groups and organizations that want to come on board. Well, terrific. So fast forward to today, you're releasing a report today, I believe, that measures Orlando's progress against the SDGs, Orlando's first voluntary local review. Congratulations. Um, say a little bit more about that process and how the SDGs relate to your work today, helping your constituents meet the kind of challenges that they face. So we are, in fact, very proud that we're unveiling the first voluntary local review today, our first, um, that'll highlight the progress that we're making. And when you look at the SDGs, you realize that they really cut across uh, many of the challenges that you've been talking to about and the Congresswoman was talking about across social, environmental, economic challenges. So whether it's eliminating poverty or inequality or addressing homelessness, economic inclusion, climate change, um, they're all critical topics that we are working on, and sometimes they've been siloed. And what we felt the SDG, SDGs did for us was to organize us in a way that we could understand the various interconnections of all of those things. So our GreenWorks Orlando initiative already been prioritizing a number of the SDGs, and we just uh, realized in this pandemic world that they provide us a unifying framework to advance both a green and equitable recovery. Wonderful. Um, and we hear that a lot, that they're a common language, a common framework, and that's one of the real sources of power of the SDGs. Now, we're going to hear in a moment from different partners, as you just mentioned, coming together around the goals from your region. Um, you're also a mayor in a very purple state, and we know how important it is to build bridges across divisions. Can you say a little bit about why these local connections are so important and how in your community you're able to use the SDGs to build bridges between constituencies across jurisdictions and even across the aisle? So we like to lead by example. We like to be the point of the spear. And, um, you know, when you think about Florida, most of the population lives around the edge on either the Gulf or the ocean. So we're kind of the big fish in the middle 
of the state um, with nobody else around us. So Orlando performs a little bit above its weight class because we're able to speak and we have 70, 80 million visitors every year. But we pride ourselves on working together. It's easier to work together across party lines at the local government level, quite honestly, than it is right now at the state level. But when I talk to some of my uh, business-oriented Republican friends, I talk about how sustainability it makes good business sense for the bottom line, and I give them examples. So probably my favorite is in 2016, uh, we were looking to prioritize energy efficiency in our own buildings as one of the first steps uh, towards doing more green building in the city. And we issued a green bond that was about $17 million to modernize and retrofit some of our older buildings to improve efficiency. We uh, utilize the funds to upgrade our lighting systems, to LED, enhance the HVAC systems, and small install smart sensors to enable building automation control systems to track and monitor the savings. And I am proud to say that today, five years later, we are saving $2 million a year in energy cost, and we're able to pay the debt service on the uh, green bond from that. But we had excess money, and we built a new police headquarters and funded 50% of that construction with savings that we are um, occurring from there. So you can be sustainable and you can be smart and you can save money. Now, that's a fantastic example. And I think there's so much that we should take confidence in from your, your you know, primary point, which is that at the local level, you can build bridges so much more easily because you're also so close to your constituents and understand very directly what what their needs and interests are. Um, I wanna ask you a, a final question, sort of about your peers. Um, you work very closely with mayors and uh, other local leaders across the country. Um, what do you say to them about why this work is so important? How do you, how do you build the case? And, and what messages also do we need the federal government to hear from you and your fellow mayors and, and local officials? And what's next for Orlando and the SDGs? <laughs> well, so a lot of questions in one. All, all in one. I'll try to answer pieces and bits of, of each of them. Um, I think for a long time, and even now when you talk about sustainability, uh, it's more focused on the environmental impact or as an environmental initiative and the SDGs, I think, help us broaden our understanding of the world and realize that it actually includes all types of issues that are not just specifically carbon reduction um, that impact our economy and our community and all of our natural resources. And then the other thing I would tell them is don't be overwhelmed by the 17 SDGs, we didn't do them all to begin with. We picked the ones that we were already working on and then uh, every year add a couple more in. So it's not overwhelming to think that you can fit them in. Um, and I, I guess beyond that, I would just offer support and say, we've started where we're at and we're gonna continue and it's been great for our community. Well, that is a wonderful conclusion. And I, I love the idea of not getting overwhelmed by the 17. I mean, most of them are things people are doing anyway. It's just a question of how people are doing them. So I you know, really appreciate that. And Mayor Dyer, I just want to thank you again on behalf of all of us for your leadership, for your action on the SDGs. You really are a tremendous model. And, and so is Orlando for us all. And we have just nine years left to 2030, and we have such a promising future ahead of us if we can summon the imagination, the solidarity, and the accountability to the points made earlier today to reach for it and just to really do it. I mean, we can only make progress on all of these issues if we do it together, and the SDGs are a very powerful platform to unite those efforts. I'm therefore very pleased now to pass the mic to another amazing leader and a friend, uh, another one from Orlando, Chris Castro, Orlando's Director of Sustainability and Resilience, who has been instrumental in Orlando's work on the SDGs to carry forward this conversation. Chris, passing the mic to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Cousins. And <clears throat> I'd like to start by expressing gratitude to you and of course to Mayor Dyer for your remarks and your leadership on advancing these goals. The news that Mayor Dyer just shared about unveiling our first voluntary local review of the SDGs is such a big milestone for Orlando and for cities around the world. 
And I, I really do want to deeply um, thank Brookings and UNF and ICLEI for the support you've given us over the years to make that a reality. Um, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening my, uh, to everyone. My, my name is Chris Castro. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Director of Sustainability and Resilience here at the City of Orlando. And I'm confident that most of you, if not all of you, have heard of and hopefully visited our great city here. If it wasn't already evident in that visit, our region is very unique. As Mayor was alluding to, we have a purple political mix, very diverse demographics and strong leadership organizations with the focus on becoming a future ready city at the forefront of inclusion, of innovation and sustainability and committed to that zero carbon future. Orlando is rapidly growing, ranking as one of the fastest growing regions in America for people to live, work and learn. And Orlando is globally facing, welcoming, as Mayor mentioned, over 75 million visitors per year who come to play, making us a top tourism destination for the world. So considering this global focus in 2018, the city of Orlando moved forward with updating our comprehensive sustainability and resilience plan, also known as Greenworks Orlando. It was during this effort when we decided to begin incorporating the SDGs as that first attempt to align these global goals with our local priorities. And following a dozen, uh, dozens of community forums and workshops, as Mayor alluded to, helping us to identify those priorities that were most important to our community, the SDG alignment led to the city passing a historic resolution that outlined the SDGs as that important framework to not only accelerate our environmental goals, but to Mayor's point, also the social and economic imperatives of our community, that need for a green and equitable future. Shortly after, we saw a momentum build around the SDGs and begin to widen. Local institutions began to focus on those, and we saw local nonprofits and community-based organizations, like Ideas for Us, began hosting think tanks and action projects to engage residents in developing local solutions to those goals. Our hometown university, UCF, created a new center to advance these SDGs across the curriculum and in the community. Our local play space foundation, Central Florida Foundation, launched an effort to integrate the SDGs into all of the donations and grants. And most impressive, our neighboring city and county governments started to work together to organize around the SDGs and establish the Regional Resilience Collaborative, what we call the R2C, which is now made up of over 35 government and academic members collectively working to advance these goals. For these reasons and many others, Orlando provides this case study for how non-government actors and local governments can align these efforts and inspire action. And so that gets us to today's panel, where we are uh, planned to briefly explore this kind of secret sauce and have brought together some incredible colleagues of mine who I'd like to introduce, starting out with Mershawn Green. She is the first chief equity official for the city of Orlando, and we look forward to hearing her remarks. Uh, James, James Bacchus, the distinguished university professor of global affairs and director of the Center for Global Economic and Environmental Opportunity, aka GEO, at the University of Central Florida, and Sandy Vidal, the Vice President of Community Strategies and Initiatives at the Central Florida Foundation. Thank you all for taking the time to share your wisdom this afternoon. And I wanted to get started out with Sandy for this first question. As I alluded in these introductions, a few years ago, Central Florida Foundation developed Thrive Central Florida to localize and implement these SDGs across the region. Tell us a little bit more about the genesis behind Thrive Central Florida and the role that that played in, uh, in, in advancing the SDGs and what you all hope to accomplish. Sure, thank you, Chris. And thank you to Brookings and the UN Foundation for inviting us to be here today. Well, the way that it started was in 2018, our board got together to work on our thousand day plan. And as we did that, the next iteration of it, I was tasked with measuring the grants that we do up against the SDG goals. And I don't know if you remember, Chris, but that was the time I came to you and said, what are SDGs? Help me to get through this. And um, you and others have been amazing mentors um, for all of us throughout the community. But we really quickly figured out that while we could map our grants to the SDGs, we really needed to measure more than just our grants. We really needed to look at spending time analyzing goals and indicators and really understanding um, what they meant. And so we crosswalked all of the SDGs 
with the pillars across the community, the city, the county, the economic development commission, the Florida chamber to look at what were the things that were important to everybody in our community. And after that work was complete, we realized that all of that work really aligned well with the social determinants of health. And so from there, we further kind of simplified things for our use within the foundation and developed Thrive. And Thrive really covers five areas that we look at following, working on, and granting to. And those are economic stability. In our community, we included housing and transportation in that because housing and transportation are really important in our community and we do not have a mass transportation system. So it's really important for us to figure out how people can get to work. We also have education, we have healthcare, we have social connection and livability, which covers our neighborhood, our physical environment and our safety. And then what Thrive really does is it catalogs data addressing key metrics for community well-being. It can means local residents and leaders for their input, developing shared goals. And at its core, what it really is, is about discovery, curiosity, breaking down silos, practical solutions, and of course, accountability. Our hope is to see the needle actually move by being purposeful in addressing these issues through data, dialogue, and decisions while evaluating the interconnectivity of these. And as you'll note, you know, many of the SDGs have interconnections between each other, as do the social determinants of health and also, of course, Thrive does. And then our hope is to really see the needle actually move. Um, I get a little bit of joke in the community because I always talk about where we fall on lists, but I think lists are great ways for us to be able to look at where are we, are we progressing forward? even better is measuring in our goals up against the SDGs. And so Thrive focuses on those five overarching areas, but the backbone is built on the SDGs and the SDG indicators. Such a powerful example of how a local foundation can really begin to align your giving. Every dollar that's going out of the foundation now, trying to track it to the global framework and to our local priorities and, and really do so in alignment with the city and the county and the region's priorities. And I think that's tremendous and, and certainly an example for other community foundations to look towards. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to, to, um, to Jim Bacchus with us. And, and Jim, you know, as the former Congressman and founding member of the UNWTO, you know perhaps better than anyone that challenges and opportunities that come from advancing something like the SDGs on a domestic and an international level. Before we dive into your role at UCF with GEO, what do you see as the value proposition? What would you tell current members of Congress and other peers? And, and how does Orlando's commitment to the SDG help us advance US engagement on the international stage around these goals? Well, thank you so much. Uh, Chris, and, and thank you all. Uh, uh, as Chris has mentioned, along the way, um, I've been privileged to serve in the Congress of the United States, and I was also the chief judge for the World Trade Organization. So I've been privileged uh, to serve at some of the highest levels of national and, and international uh, governance. And one of the things I would say to anyone, uh, uh, any national or international uh, level of responsibility would be that we're not going to be able to do what we need to do nationally or internationally unless we first do uh, what must be done at the grassroots of the world. Now, a, a problem we have now in so many areas of global concern is that we cannot summon sufficient political will to take real action. Climate change is one example. Um, COVID is another. You know, biodiversity is one more. We'll be learning a lot more about all too soon. The truth is that uh, those who happen to be entrusted with making decisions for us at national and international levels are human beings, just like we are. They want to feel they can uh, make bold decisions and uh, find support for having made them from the people back home. Uh, thus, uh, the example uh, set uh, so grandly by the city of Orlando and its great mayor, 
Buddy Dyer, my longtime friend. And uh, the example we're trying to set through all our community actions throughout the region of Central Florida, if we can demonstrate that uh, new ideas, uh, new ways of coming together can work to help achieve the social, economic, environmental goals uh, that uh, we share uh, through the SDGs, if we can uh, summon the political will to do these things locally and demand that they be done also uh, at the state level, at the national and international level, then we're much more likely to be able to do what needs to be done through international cooperation. Uh, what we need to do is show those who would lead us that we can lead ourselves and that uh, we can provide them with the support that's needed to make leadership a success for global sustainable development. Wonderful, thank you, Jim. And, and we're gonna come back to you to, to really dive further into GEO, but I'd like to turn it over to Mershon. Mershon, you, you're Orlando's first chief equity official hired as part of the response to last year's mass protest against police brutality and systemic racism following the killing of George Floyd and others. Uh, you were tasked by with reviewing the city's policies and programs and procedures and really addressing uh, the systemic inequities in city government. Uh, Mayor Dyer said, uh, nothing is off limits. And, and that's essentially your mandate as our chief equity official. Talk to us about how you're approaching this and what has been your starting point. I know you're relatively new into this role, only months into it, but talk to us about where you are and where you see things going uh, for equity in Orlando. So first I'd like to thank you, um, Chris and the Brookings um, Institute for being a part of this today. Well, starting off, as you stated, um, I've just been taking the time to understand the inner workings of the city, um, reviewing the policies, programs, procedures, and other initiatives the city is involved in, just so I can understand how they work um, and those that they touch. And then I'll progress to speaking with stakeholders, which includes anyone working with the city and anyone affected by uh, the city to understand their experiences and using that feedback to determine how we can improve our current policies, procedures, programs, and initiatives. Uh, we also plan to include staff training um, so that we can provide more knowledge sharing and professional development opportunities for city staff to better understand equity and see how it can be embedded in everything that we do. So building upon that information received, the data, the feedback, and also the training, the goal is to work collaborative collaboratively with all the departments and the community to create an equity action plan and implement that plan and then just monitor the progress to see um, how our interactions have changed, how our policies and procedures and programs that we're offering to see the effectiveness of those things and how we can improve them. That's wonderful. It's really trying to uncover those gaps within our own policies and procedures. As Mayor Dyer mentioned in his remarks, we like to lead by example. Right, and we can't we can't be asking others in our community to lead with equity if we're not doing it ourselves. And that's why I think it's incredible that Mayor Dyer had the foresight to 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 place a historic position like yours in uh, the role that you are, and and at that kind of C level as well. And then you know being able to look internally at our police, our you know our procurement, our HR, and and even eventually externally at how we create this culture the way we've been doing with Greenwork. So that's tremendous. And we'll come back and try to dive into a little bit about SDG alignment. But I wanted to get back to Sandy real quick. We, we have a couple more minutes here for each one of us before our lightning round question. Uh, mm -hmm. And so Sandy, I wanted to go back to um, this kind of challenge that we often face around groups working in silos. Uh, we know that this is a challenge, not just in Orlando, but ar around the country and around the world. And so how are SDGs being used as this connecting platform to break those silos and begin and begin bringing together different communities so that we can address it, especially in a polarizing and kind of politically divided situation that we find ourselves in today? Thanks, Chris. Well, we have all sorts of groups that are working on the issues and we put millions of dollars into solutions, but the needles don't seem to move. We have ideas, we have good people, we 
just need to be more organized. <laughs> Interconnectivity, integration, implementation coupled with strategy and shared goals is the beginning of the solution. For example, if we have the goal of ending hunger, SDG number two, we might look at what causes hunger. It might be access to food, it might be poverty, it might be something else. What we do know is that lack of food in our community is not the problem. It's connected to other things. And so to tackle the issue, we currently put together task forces, we look at data, we do lots of reports, we have committees, we ask nonprofits, they all work on the problem some together, some independently. But you know, when we put together Thrive, we said, what if we integrate these resources and bring people together with a more strategic system-wide approach? And by focusing on the issues and solutions and taking agenda and politics out of the equation, we can be more productive. Is there always gonna be some politics? Absolutely, of course, but focusing on the end goals and, and having the SDGs as the end goals really helps us to give some clarity around the issue. Then we can agree on what will help us to get farther faster. And then implementation comes when we decide on those shared goals and strategy. We assign ownership, we measure the results. We may make mistakes along the way, but in the end, what matters is we learn from them, we move forward. And so we're currently in the process of using work groups right now to bring together diverse viewpoints to prioritize the issues and develop goals. And by using the SDGs and the SDG indicators as the North Star, we can work together collectively to ensure that we're maximizing our available resources and minimizing waste. Another great example, you know, using Thrive as a way to bring communities together. So don't think, don't forget about your place-based foundation as a powerful convener and one that can kind of get all parties on the same footing. I know that Central Florida Foundation certainly has helped in that respect here in Orlando. And thank you so much for your good work, Sandy, and pushing that forward. We're going to turn it to Jim now. And uh, we do want to dive further into UCF, our hometown university, one of the largest universities in America, um, has really stepped up to advance these SDGs uh, by establishing the GEO Center, the Global Economic and Environmental Opportunity. You are the founding director of this center. So Jim, tell us a little bit more about um, you know, UCF's rationale in committing to and embracing the SDGs and why such a commitment is important for American universities. The sustainability is part of the UCF strategic plan. Uh, we serve uh, students worldwide, but uh, the vast majority of our 70,000 or so students are um, here within Central Florida. And so we want to serve their communities as well. Um, UCF has always been all about partnerships. Um, SDG 17, mm -hmm. and um, we created GEO, as we call it, uh, which has a mission specifically to help achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, GEO is uh, meant to be a catalyst. It's uh, also meant to be a source of support uh, for uh, activism, governmental, non-governmental, mixed, um, local, regional, national, international, that's aimed at achieving the sustainable development goals. And we're working all over the world, but we're especially working here in the region, uh, engaging uh, our faculty expertise and our students. And one last point I'd like to make, because we're not, we're, I know we're short of time. I, I was much impressed with the young woman who spoke at the outset uh, about uh, youth and uh, addressing the SDGs, uh, she, she said a lot of young people feel they're more qualified than we older people uh, to do this job. I, I hope they are because we, uh, I'm afraid, have not been doing it nearly as well as we should, but uh, one of our obligations is to do all we're doing for them and for their children and uh, also to make sure that they are equipped better than we are to address uh, all of these uh, issues that are already changing their lives in all kinds of ways. Uh, well, GEO is uh, intended as one part of an overall UCF effort to help uh, uh, students uh, become the kinds of citizens who can actually make that kind of difference in the world. Excellent, thank you, Jim, and appreciate all your leadership as well in advancing this great work across the region. 
Michonne, we're going to come to you to close out our last question. And then I do have a rapid fire for each one of you. So, so think through that. Um, but but Michonne, central to the goal of the SDGs is leaving no one behind. Um, how do you see the SDGs helping to uh, address some of these longstanding inequities and inequalities across race and gender? And, and what do you think um, it, you know, it means for the city's commitment to the SDGs in supporting your work in advancing equity? Sorry, I have my microphone muted. No worries. <laughs> the goal of leaving no one um, behind actually aligns with Mayor Dyer's vision and the city of Orlando's vision to create um, a city where every resident is equally valued, equally protected, and has equitable access to opportunities. Um, I can also appreciate that the SDGs are data-driven. Um, the SDGs provide us with an inclusive framework to address community issues, cutting across the social, economic, and environmental imperatives. Um, the SDGs help us to see the interconnectedness of these issues and the imperatives to address them holistically, rather than, as uh, Sandy was saying earlier, in silos. Um, we cannot just address affordable housing by keeping rent payments low. We must also consider the total cost of home ownership and things such as energy burdens in order to help um, improve overall quality of life. And as the United Nations Global Compact puts it, um, business cannot thrive unless people and planet are thriving. So in order um, to ensure that people are thriving, we must get to the root cause of issues and determine what barriers are present but we can't do that um, without engaging those who are directly impacted. So just really thinking about that and, and where I am working for government, government must continue to discover ways to empower residents and community to guide the city's priorities. Um, we're working to do that, but not just government, um, also companies and nonprofits should be also engaging um, the city uh, residents and community to guide their work. Thank you, incredible. Thank you for your leadership as well, Mershon. It's really been a pleasure to work uh, you know, side by side here in Orlando. We got a lot more good things on the rise. With that, we are um, having to close up uh, today's panel. So I just wanted to close up by thanking each one of you once again and sharing your insights and your knowledge on how we're working to advance that green, resilient and equitable future in Orlando and Central Florida and the world at large. And now I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce Lena Abdamoti a human rights advocate and Girl Up Teen Advisor alumna to provide us some concluding remarks for the day. Lena. Thank you so much and hello everyone. I first wanna thank the Brookings Institution as well as the United Nations Foundation uh, for the opportunity to speak at this meaningful event. Um, today, I wanna to encourage you to help fight to make sure that all Americans, no matter their background, feel like they belong because if we do so, we can truly achieve great things. First, I want to tell you a bit about my own experiences living in Kansas as a Muslim, Arab, hijab-wearing, first-generation American. Now, growing up in a conservative community in the Midwest, I've not always been treated like I belong because of my identity. I would also get the occasional racist remark. Although these remarks would hurt, they inspired me uh, to fight for the core purposes of the SDGs to make sure that no one, no matter his or her identity, is left behind. I currently work with the psychiatry sector of Stanford Medical School to help ensure that some of the most vulnerable groups in our country get proper mental health care. I also became involved with Girl Up of the United Nations Foundation as a teen advisor and regional leader to lobby on Capitol Hill and advocate for gender equality for women and girls in my local community and abroad. I started fundraising um, as part of an initiative to help bring refugees living in camps solar powered light. And because of these experiences, I was invited to speak at the 45th session of the UN Human Rights Council to advocate for the SDGs and make sure that no one, regardless of skin color, religion, ethnicity, race, or gender is left behind. Through these activities, I have experienced firsthand what happens when youth advocate for the SDGs. While I have at times felt like I do not belong, I also recognize that this country allows me to speak up for my community and for other marginalized identities. And this, and this reality is both inspiring and reassuring. I urge you all to think about ways to ensure that marginalized communities feel like they belong so that this country can truly live up to the motto, justice and liberty for all. 
Together, we can work to build a future that leaves no one behind. That is the central aim of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Our commitment to achieving the SDGs is a first step. Now we must put those commitments into action. Thank you and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.